Kia ora, good evening. I'm Dave Gooselink. A veteran anti-oil activist was found guilty this week after an attempt to derail an industry conference in Queenstown almost four years ago. Environmental activist Rosemary Penwarden has been appearing in the Dunedin District Court in a three-day trial. The 64-year-old was charged with forgery and using a forged document after her actions prior to an international petroleum conference being held in Queenstown in September 2019. She admitted to creating a fake email address and using the letterhead and logos of private organisations to send out a phony postponement letter to all delegates. We apologise for the inconvenience, the email read. We will endeavour to reimburse stakeholders for registrations, including flights to and from Queenstown where possible. This afternoon, a jury found Penwarden guilty on both forgery charges after three hours of deliberation. I totally respect the decision that was made by those jurors. They've sat through three days, two and a half days. Um, I respect the judge. And, what, and the way it was all done. Judge Michael Turner didn't enter a conviction, with Penwarden granted bail and her sentencing set down for September. In Dunedin, the South Today. A petition calling for the resignation of Gore District Council Chief Executive Steve Parry was presented earlier this week, with councillors voting not to receive it. The petition was put forward at a Gore District Council meeting on Tuesday after gaining almost 5,000 signatures. It followed a very public relationship breakdown between the CEO and Mayor Ben Bell over the last year with the petition labelling Parry as a bully. Councillors stated during the afternoon meeting that they had full faith in their CEO. Some believe the petition was disrespectful and had no credibility, although Gore's Mayor disagreed. The employment of the CE is not a public matter and the employment relationship is private, it is not a matter for the public to debate. If there are serious allegations of wrongdoing, then the council as the employer must act. But beyond that, it should ignore wide-ranging or baseless allegations. And all those in favour, please say aye. And against. I'd like to be recorded as against. Thank you. Councillors received a report, but not the petition itself. Their decision is likely to upset thousands of people in the Gore community and around the region who signed the petition and wanted to see Steve Perry resign from his role as CEO for the good of the council. In Gore, the South Today. Well, a climate activist group has launched a campaign targeting what they say are high-polluting vehicles in urban areas. The protesters put stickers on privately owned SUVs in the city, highlighting their carbon emissions. Stick that. Climate activist group Extinction Rebellion has launched a new campaign in Christchurch, focusing on high carbon emitting SUVs. The End Urban SUVs project is encouraging supporters to stick emissions rating stickers on private vehicles they spot around the city. Long-time climate campaigner Lynn Roberts claims vehicles used by tradies or in a rural setting would be exempt from their guerrilla campaign. The target is ones that are clearly for prestige and um, status and not really thinking about their carbon impact. Supporters are sent starter packs containing a bunch of the stickers for a $10 donation. While the stickers are being added to the vehicles without the permission of their owners, the group claims they're easily removable. Activists are encouraged to enter the vehicle's number plate on the Right Car website to accurately determine the vehicle's carbon emission rating. Robert says the idea of the campaign is to start a conversation about the popularity of the utility vehicles. Sales have increased 700% since 2009 and they're outweighing all efforts we're putting into making electric cars and all the rest of it. So many of the emission increases over the last few years have been because we're buying more SUVs. However, she admits not all car owners would be pleased to find a sticker on their vehicle, but says activists are told not to be confrontational. Robert says car companies spend millions on advertising SUVs compared with all other vehicles. It suits the car companies to push them and use whatever tricks they can to persuade us to think that we really can't live without them. The group are hoping their campaign will prompt people to think more about being socially responsible. In Christchurch, the South Today. 
The country's longest running cheese making operation is closing its doors in Southland after more than a century of dairy production. Southland is well known for producing excellent cheese over the years, but the production lines are finally closing at Fonterra's well known cheese factory in Edendale. The facility has been operating for 140 years, producing up to 10,000 tonnes of cheese a year for domestic and international sale. The company says the cheese plant hadn't been operating since the end of last year, with the closure putting 34 workers in the firing line. Fonterra is now working closely with affected employees, with some exploring redeployment opportunities within the company. Locals are disappointed about the closure of the local factory, which has been a significant part of the region's history. While the closure marks the end of an era for cheese production in Southland, Fonterra insists it's committed to ensuring a strong dairy sector in New Zealand, with production continuing at its nine other plants. In Edendale, The South Today. A Central Otago Conservation Trust celebrated the first results of a new environmental monitoring program earlier in the week. The Southern Lakes Sanctuary Trust says innovative new technology is helping them to better measure the health and lives of local lizards and other animals. The Southern Lakes Sanctuary Trust is taking steps forward with potentially groundbreaking monitoring and trapping techniques in central Otago. The Queenstown-based conservation group monitors and protects native plant and animal life from Wakatipu Basin across to Makaroa. The team's just completed the first trial of the new reptile monitoring technique involving environmental DNA. They collect shedding fragments from the lizard's habitats, allowing them to measure the health and occupancy of the animals. Wakatipu Hub Coordinator Bonnie Wilkins says eDNA monitoring is more cost-effective than older techniques, which were more intrusive and labour-intensive. The results are also more accurate and reliable. We're laying out these pipes that have a filter paper in them. We can just leave those in, in the lizard's environment and hope that they are going to move through the pipes and then we can get their DNA from the filter paper. The Southern Lake Sanctuary Trust has also been putting into use the new self-resetting AT22 pest traps. Workers have set up 23 traps around Bob's Cove area, catching more than 300 possums over a nine-month period. The next step is trialling integrated air recognition cameras in areas occupied by Kia which should mean the traps only catch pre-programmed predators instead of the curious birds. Um, we will have a trap node on the camera, so we can monitor the bait levels and battery levels, but there's also an AI camera, so that can tell the trap whether to fire or not fire, dependent on the AI machine learning of the, the image recognition. So. Project Director Paul Kavana believes it's not only important to trap and monitor pests, but to monitor the native biodiversity that we are trying to protect. The Conservation Trust is now on the hunt for more funding to enable the team to expand the use of eDNA monitoring and traps in a variety of different habitats. In Queenstown, the South Today. If I Akine, still to come on Southern Newsweek. Sweet sounds spilled out of Dunedin's Town Hall earlier in the week as schools came together to perform in the Big Sing. And science was in the air down south as hundreds of school pupils put their research to the test. Welcome back. Well, Dunedin's Town Hall was filled with the sound of music as youth choirs competed in the region's Big Sing Secondary School's Choral Festival. Around 450 pupils took to the stage on Monday, singing their hearts out in the iconic competition. Sweet melodies and harmonies ringing out through the Dunedin Town Hall. High school choirs from across the local regions have been competing in the Big Sing Secondary School's Choral Festival, covering a range of musical styles. We've got our Big Sing, Otago South Canterbury Big Sing happening today and we're delighted to be back here in the Town Hall after two years. Around 450 pupils performed in the regional competition, which included schools from across Otago and South Canterbury. Choir numbers are still growing back across the country's secondary schools, with about 10 fewer entries yesterday than in the years before COVID. 
14 schools and choirs taking part today. So a little bit um, less in number in choirs than we've had pre-COVID, but we're building up again, which we're delighted about. A number of Otago schools won big awards, including Otago Girls, Kings and Queens and Mount Aspiring College. The regional event concluded last night with a gala concert at the Town Hall, with Southland choirs competing in their event today. Regional finalists will go on to Auckland in August to compete at the Big Sing finale. In Dunedin, the South Today. Meanwhile, Young Minds in Southland put on a vibrant display of knowledge and creativity as part of a social science fair. Hundreds of school pupils from Invercargill exhibited their worldly findings at the event, showcasing a diverse range of topics. Rows of colourful display boards bringing the world to Invercargill. The 18th Southland Social Science Fair has kicked into gear, with students from years 5 to 10 submitting an exhibition on a topic of their choice. Over half the entrants are intermediate students. With 309 exhibits this year, fair organisers are calling it the best one yet. We were expecting about 210, but we had a whole lot of extra ones showed up, so it's strained the capacity of the place a bit, but it was... Uh, there's some really good quality stuff here and we're, we're very pleased. The selection includes a wide range of topics spanning from history, current events, global issues, genealogy and biography. The fair encourages students to explore different ways to conduct and display their research, from web browsing, books, interviews and more. Sisters Hannah and Rebecca Lacey used the same food the Anzacs ate at Gallipoli to make scrabble pieces, a bowling alley and even a usable chair. We thought it would be cool to show how indestructible hard deck is and so we decided to do bowling because it's pretty indestructible. The hard baked mixture of flour, salt and water made all the objects rock solid, leaving the sisters pleased with the outcome. It is so cool and how people get to play the bowling and just play Scrabble if they want. It is cool. Other displays included beekeeping, the Springbok tour, bonsai trees, and even knot tying. Southland students giving a bit of everything a try and showing others what a fascinating place the world is. In Invercargill, the South Today. Staying in Southland and a Southland primary school has won big this week, scoring a large grant to upgrade their sports facilities. East Gore School are the lucky recipients of the huge award, which also came with a surprise visit from a former All Black. A southern Mexican wave for a Kiwi rugby legend. East Gore School is celebrating after being awarded a $10,000 sports grant, thanks to AA Insurance's Big Little sponsorship. Former All Black Kevin Mialamu made the trip down south to meet the excited young school children as the ambassador of Big Little. So one of the things that stood out to me is we only, they said they only had one rugby post, so um, yeah, I was really keen on making sure that we could um, make sure they have one so they could have a, a full rugby field. The Big Little sponsorship is aimed at supporting primary schools and helping boost grassroots sports. The Southland Primary School was one of around 4,000 schools who entered this year's competition. Principal Wendy Kitto amazed at the bonus opportunity of meeting the All Black legend. Oh, hanging out with Kevin Mialamu, how great is that? Having him in Gore, having him in the school, um, you know, he's such a nice guy. Um, yeah, so, so lucky. To have him here. She says the money will go towards new basketball hoops and a second set of rugby posts as part of efforts to help keep local kids active. In Gore, the South today. And one Southland basketball player is making a comeback, bouncing back from cancer and making his way back onto the court. Basketball legend Alex Pledger has made his long-awaited return to the Southland Sharks after a two-year hiatus from the sport. Back in the shark tank and keeping a keen eye on the play. Good news for Southland Sharks with the return of basketball legend Alex Pledger to the team after a hard-fought two-year battle with cancer. The former Tall Black was diagnosed with colorectal cancer in 2021, his radiation therapy and a major operation keeping him off the court since then. Now, cancer-free, he's making a comeback. There were times where it wasn't too bad and there were times where it was 
it just seemed never ending. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm definitely glad I'm, uh, I'm on the other side of it now. Pledger began with the Sharks in 2016, this year marking his fifth season with the team. Just two weeks in, he's happy with his performance so far, and his teammates are pleased to have him back. Just his, his presence, his, his knowledge, um, leadership, it's, it's really, really good to have him back. He's a good dude too, on and off the court, he's really, he's really about that team culture and team vibe, so yeah, it's been awesome. Someone like myself who's a young up-and-coming player, it's cool to have someone like that to get tips and pointers off. He says the support of his team and those around him has meant a lot. Yeah, to come back and have so many of those guys still here and just welcome me in and, uh, you know, help me um, you know, give give basketball another go. Um, yeah, that's been awesome. The Sharks are currently sixth on the Sal's NBL ladder after thumping the Otago Nuggets 116 to 79 on Monday. Pledger hoping they can build on that momentum throughout the remaining weeks of the league. In Invercargill, the South today. Two Dunedin schoolgirls were surprised to learn they won a flag design competition after being handpicked by some of their sporting heroes. The group entered their designs at the Fern Fever event, aimed at helping encourage young women to get more involved in sport. Passing down skills to the next generation and hoping to inspire more girls into playing football. A flag design competition was held at the Fern Fever event in Dunedin back in March, giving pupils the challenge of designing their own Swiss or New Zealand flag. The exercise was to mark one of the games being held in the city for the upcoming Women's FIFA World Cup and made for some serious competition. Some of them were super speedy, others didn't necessarily want to move on to the next activity because they took it very seriously. Millie from Bell McEwen Intermediate and Victoria from Anderson's Bay School were named as the winners with Southern Football representatives presenting them with their flags printed out plus free tickets to the game. The two flags were hand-picked and signed by some of the football firm players who hoped to encourage the girls to continue on with the sport. You see a lot of girls come to the programs and events that we run quite shy, quite standoffish, but at the end of it their confidence has grown and it's just, it's just awesome to see. After receiving their awards, their classmates were taken outdoors for a skills session with the Southern Football crew. Whether it's for a year, whether it's for a month, we just want them to have some fun and get out and try to get some activity and maybe choose our game for the future. The Fern Fever event aimed to encourage young girls to give sport a go in a safe and fun environment. Organisers say interest in women's sport is continuing to grow, with the FIFA Women's World Cup due to start later next month. In Dunedin, the South Today. FI Akine, still to come on Southern Newsweek. A Queenstown kitten has returned to his central Otago home after winning a number of awards at a recent cat show. And an award-winning musician stopped off in Dunedin this week, trying his hands on a massive instrument. Welcome back. Well, a Queenstown kitten has not only recovered from a near-death experience, but is also cleaning up at cat shows. Russell the cat has returned to his central Otago home after winning a number of awards in Christchurch, which also saw him nominated for an even bigger prize. The little cat who could, nine-month-old Russell has made his return to central Otago after back-to-back -back wins in some Christchurch cat shows. Russell the Miracle Mogi is deaf and has limited eyesight after he was believed to be attacked by a hawk in Kingston as a six-week-old kitten. But that hasn't stopped the little champion from winning eight awards across the Canterbury All Breeds Cat Show and the Long Hair Cat Breeders Association Show. Anyone has a supreme exhibit, which means he beat out all of the other domestic cats, long hand, short haired, and the companion pedigrees. Despite recovering from damaged discs in his back and no function in one of his legs, the ginger kitty doesn't receive any special treatment for the events. Proud foster mother Lydia McCarthy says at each show, judges were always unaware of his background while judging until they were asked at their last event. No, they don't know about him. We only had one judge apparently at the last one who asked. She kind of went, what's wrong with him? Mm. Because she could tell that something wasn't right with him. Yeah. Russell is now in the running to be named Cat of the Year and will likely be competing later this year in the Southern Cross All Breeds Cat Show in Dunedin. In Queenstown, the South Today. 
Well, an award-winning jazz pianist stopped off in Dunedin while on his New Zealand tour this week, trying his hands on what's believed to be one of the largest pianos in the world. Bill Cunliffe was blown away by the massive instrument, further cementing the strong love he has for the region. Playing a smooth jazz tune on a one-of-a-kind piano, American jazz pianist Bill Cunliffe was in Dunedin during his New Zealand tour when he caught wind of an 18-foot piano that he just couldn't resist. Adrian Mann built the Alexander piano as a teenager, which had Cunliffe in awe, not just by the sounds it produced, but its sheer size. It actually looks like it's bigger than 9 feet to me, uh, 18 feet. It's just because it's so massive, I just can't believe it. After playing a tune, he felt like he could have played jazz on the 6 meter 1.2 ton piano for hours. This one of a kind instrument just added to the love the Grammy award winning artist already had for Dunedin. I like Dunedin too, just the architecture and the hilliness of it and the warmth of the people. So I thought I wanted to come back. Even though Cunliffe has a deep love for this piano, no sale was made as it's too big for him to take back home. Also, the sentimental value for man makes it hard to part with. In Dunedin, the South Today. A group of Southland women have gathered in Winton to try their hand at turning garden scraps into art. An open day held by a local floral art club was aimed at attracting more members who were keen to share some of their creative techniques. Christmas came early to Winton as this group of women transformed a pile of plants and sticks into a festive wreath. The Central Southland Floral Art Club decided to host an open day workshop to give people the chance to have a go at something new and find out what the club's about. There's around 30 members in the floral art group, but the women were hoping the winter wreath making will help attract more people to their monthly meetings. And there's all sorts of tips and tricks that we can share with people and that they can um, create something that they're really proud of and that uh, then they can give it uh, to loved ones with lots of love and care. Around 20 new people attended the open day who were given a presentation on different techniques, models and materials before getting to make their own pieces. The artists use materials either found roadside or in their own gardens, meaning the club have had to adapt to new ways of creating floral art. Our mothers had huge big gardens and lots of flowers. Today we don't have big gardens like that. We still use uh, flowers, but we use them in new and interesting and creative ways. The club aims to cater for all skill levels, hosting a range of different styles of design meetings so all members can continue to learn something new. In Winton, the South Today. And continuing with the artistic theme, one dedicated Dunedin student has unravelled his infinite creativity to the public as part of Worldwide Public Knit Day. Polytech student Tristan McGregor has weaved together passion and innovation as part of an incredibly long knitting mission. Knitting a never-ending class project as this really long colourful scarf grows in size each day. Tristan John McGregor's project is using more than $1,000 worth of wool to make, with around 7 to 10 threads used at a time. The Bachelor of Visual Arts student started knitting the remarkable project almost a year ago and isn't planning on stopping anytime soon. It's something that doesn't have to end. It's something that you don't have to kind of come to a climax on, you know. It just allows itself to just keep going, just continuously. McGregor showcases progress on the knitting project at the Otago Settlers Museum over the weekend, celebrating the worldwide knit and public day. But he's knitting on more than one special day, having spent almost every day since September knitting towards the project. What I want to do is actually get it to the circumference of my body, so if I can get it, if I can get it bigger than I am to where I can lay on it and it's, you know, longer than me, then I'll be happy, I'll be, <clears throat> I'll be very excited by that time. McGregor yeah. plans to continue adding different colour combinations, but is unsure when his never-ending knitting project will reach its final thread. In Dunedin, the South Today. And that wraps up this edition of Southern Newsweek. For the latest news and videos from the Southern Region, head online to odt.co.nz. And you can follow Channel 39 on YouTube and the South Today NZ on Facebook to catch our news bulletins and stories on demand. We'll see you again next week. Matewa.
Public Interest Journalism, funded through New Zealand On Air.